Welcome to today's edition of podcast. Today is Tuesday, January 31st, 2023. I am Rifat Mannan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston right now. So today we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Raul Gonzalez, who needs no introductions. And she has been on this platform quite a few times. And uh, he is Associate Professor of Pathology at Emory University Hospital. And he's going to present a talk on infectious diseases of the digestive tract. And the title of his talk will be Infectious Insanity in the Digestive System. And as always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows and also on Twitter if you feel like. And we will pass those questions to Dr. Gonzalez towards the end of the session. And over to you now, Dr. Gonzalez. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I always enjoy the opportunity to give a PathCast lecture. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. I'm Raul Gonzalez, and this talk will be Infectious Insanity in the Digestive System, which will complete my trilogy that I guess began with mesenchymal madness and then neuroendocrine nuttiness in the GI tract. I'm going to stop my video now so that you can focus on the PowerPoint. And a couple little bits before we get started. This is mostly just going to be a fun tour of some interesting GI tract cases, uh, luminal GI and uh, the liver as well, and discussing differential diagnosis. Obviously, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of infectious organisms that can involve the GI tract. I can't possibly cover everything, but hopefully this will give a good overview between the cases and the differentials of, you know, most of what you need to know. Now, if you do enjoy this session, I do have another session that you uh, can have access to uh, on the USCAP e-learning platform uh, called Stop Bugging Me, Digestive Tract Infectious Organisms from Obvious to Subtle. Uh, that I gave at their Palm Springs location last year, almost exactly this time last year. Um, it does cost a little bit of money, so it's not free like PathCast, but it is available. It's not too much, hopefully. And I didn't repeat any cases. One or two diagnoses I'm kind of repeating, but with a different spin. But all of the cases from the use cap session are different from what I'll present today. And with that intro done, we will begin. Uh, as Rafat said, I will take questions at the end of the session. Please feel free to post them on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, if you prefer Twitter hashtags, post it there and use that hashtag infectious insanity. And we will look at them after I go through the cases. And we will begin now, uh, top of the GI tract with the esophagus. This is case one, a patient with a sore throat. I'm gonna go over to the screen share here or already looking at this esophagus biopsy or at low power, looking around. And of course, I'm not gonna spend too much time going over every last fragment because I have pre-screen needs. There's a couple different things I want to show off here. Hopefully, let's get this in focus. Everyone can notice the not terribly subtle viral cytopathic effect here. We can see it all throughout the lamina propria, the sub, I guess really the submucosa. The squamous mucosa is not affected, but we have fibroblasts and even endothelial cells involved. Let's go in one higher power, make sure we have enough light. And you can see that it's the classic kind of bright red, maybe slightly more purple on this slide, nuclear inclusions that, you know, spoiler alert, this is cytomegalovirus involving the esophagus, and it can involve anywhere in the GI tract. But I'm starting off with this case to remind everyone, never stop at one diagnosis. Why have one when two will do? We do have an ulcer in the esophagus. When you have an ulcer and you're thinking infection, obviously you want to think about um, CMV, which we've looked at. You want to think about herpes, but lots of things can involve the esophagus. And if we go Let's get him in focus here, right in this area. You will also hopefully notice these slender little hyphae that are 
trickling throughout and kind of shish kebabbing this superficial keratin debris. Now, even though it's not really involving the thick section of the epithelium, it's not so much in here, this can still be pathogenic. So that fungus, of course, in the esophagus is usually going to be candida. So we started off our cases with a twofer. This is esophageal candidiasis and CMV. So candida is the most common esophageal infection. We see it not uncommonly. And it appears endoscopically as white plaques. Other things can look like that. Um, glycogenic acanthosis can look like a white plaque. I've even seen sloughing and sloughing esophagitis called a white plaque. But when they say white plaque, they're usually going to want you to rule out candida. And I'll usually get a GMS stain, even if I don't see anything, just to make sure there's definitely no fungus in there. And as I mentioned, there have been some recent studies showing that it can be clinically relevant and can be causing problems for the patient, even if it's not clearly invading the intact epithelial tissue. And then CMV, we've all seen CMV. It usually occurs in immunocompetent patients. Uh, I think I meant to put immunocompromised patients, which makes sense given I say you have multiple infections. It's always nice to have one or two typos in these lectures because that way you're keeping on your toes and you're definitely paying attention while you're presenting them. Um, but more to the point, while candida appears as white plaques, CMV appears as punched out ulcers. And the viral cytopathic effect occurs in endothelial cells and also stromal cells, as we showed. Now, the differential diagnoses for both of these are worth noting. And for each of these cases, I'll give a differential throughout the digestive tract, not necessarily just that organ. So candida is the number one fungus, I would say, in the digestive tract, and we usually see it in the esophagus. If you see fungus elsewhere in the GI tract, especially like the columnar line GI tract, the patient is probably pretty darn sick. But the options include aspergillus, mucor, histoplasma, which I've seen in a small bowel biopsy of someone who unfortunately passed the next day, and then uh, basidio bolus, which often involves kind of the colon and the uh, pericolonic fat. I shouldn't say often, it's fairly rare. Uh, there are some countries where it's endemic and also the southwestern United States. Um, and spoiler alert, if you want to see a case of that, there is that other session I gave that I mentioned. Now, the differential for viral cytopathic effect in the digestive tract, obviously, in addition to CMV, there's HSV, which hopefully we're all fairly familiar with, VZV, varicella zoster, can occur in the esophagus and the stomach. Those patients are usually very sick, and that fairly mimics the margination, multinucleation molding of herpes. Um, but the stain will be different. HSV immunostain will be negative, and VZV will be positive. Adenovirus gives you these glassy nuclei that look similar to HSV, except they're not multinucleated. HPV causes the coilocytic effect. Measles causes the Warth and Finkley giant cells. And then even with the, uh, I guess, prevalence or mini epidemic of monkeypox, which has recently been named Mpox uh, in the past year or so, I haven't personally seen a case of this in the GI tract, but it can happen. I remember seeing a rectal case posted on Twitter a while back. So something to be aware of if you, if your institution services, serves a community where that may still be prevalent. That is case one, and we'll move on now to case two. This is a patient who has abdominal pain. And we're from the esophagus now to the stomach, and we have one nice piece of tissue. We can already tell a low power. There's maybe a little bit of top heavy, heavy inflammation. It's not terrible. It's not uh, clearly inflamed at low power, but when we get to intermediate power and then high power, we can definitely tell that there's a good amount of plasma cells in the lamina propria, which of course should not be there in the stomach. And already on this crypt, well, I guess pit in the stomach, this pit I jumped down to, we can already see hanging out here in this crypt, a little hard to get land on him, but there are a couple small helicobacter organisms, even better if we look down there. So these small ones are um, 
no stranger to anyone here, I would hope, Helicobacter pylori. But once again, let's have a little bit of fun with a twofer here, if I can find the other thing I'm looking for. Let's see. The other one was a bit more subtle in the mucin, and I found it yesterday, which means I won't find it today. But if you'll bear with me, maybe I can convince you that Helicobacter pylori's big brother or cousin is also hiding out. Here we go. This probably as good as we're going to get, and this is about as bright as my scope can get. So maybe a tiny bit of imagination will have to be involved. But if you look just above the tip of my arrow there, you can see some slightly larger organisms. Let me get in focus. And if this will carry, I can even annotate them for you. We have a small focus, not as obvious as the Helicobacter pylori, but we have these longer, vaguely spiral rather than curvilinear organisms, which, as I mentioned, is the big brother or big cousin to Helicobacter pylori, and that's Helicobacter helmonii. Here we go. So we've got uh, two for the price of one. Try to give you your money's worth, or at least your time's worth when you are joining in on the pathcast. So H. pylori, a uh, common infection, can cause um, has been linked to adenocarcinoma and malt lymphoma. So if patients go untreated, they are at risk of developing neoplasia. So definitely you want to diagnose it so the patient can be treated. It does not necessarily cause gross abnormalities. I've seen plenty of cases where the EGD report said stomach appears grossly normal, and then there's just millions and millions of Helicobacter pylori. Uh, conversely, I've seen erythematous gross stomachs that were normal microscopically. So that's just a reminder to not rely just on that. And then everyone has a different threshold for when to perform immunohistochemistry to look for H. pylori. Some people like to do it on every biopsy. I do not. I stain really in three settings. If there's a history of helicobacter infection without proven eradication on a subsequent biopsy, because you don't want to miss residual organisms. If there's chronic active gastritis, good plasma cells plus good neutrophils, not just acute inflammation, because you can see that in reactive gastropathy, but chronic active gastritis, or really striking chronic gastritis without acute inflammation, maybe you know double to triple what we saw in this patient. Those are the scenarios in which I would get the immunostain for a helicobacter. And that immunostain cross-reacts with helicobacter helmonii, so you don't have to worry about, quote unquote, missing that. It'll pick up any helicobacter species. Now, this organism is more common in children. Maybe you'll see it on a pediatrics rotation. And this is because um, they are perhaps a little more friendly with their pets. Uh, you know, if, if the dog, the family dog, licks the kid's face a lot, that's one way to get Helicobacter helmonii. These cases usually have less striking inflammation, so it may be a bit trickier to pick up if you're focusing on how inflamed the stomach is or is not. But you're still at a risk, these patients, of developing malignancy, so it's not something you can just ignore. Now, let's see. The differential for visible bacteria in the digestive tract, I may be getting a little specific, but things that you can see. There's Sarcina ventriculi, uh, which some people have tried to say is now renamed, I think, Clostridioides ventriculi, but Sarcina is sort of what most people still call it. That occurs in the stomach and gastric outlet obstruction, much larger than Helicobacter. Micrococcus, smaller than Helicobacter, maybe, maybe not actually pathogenic. E. coli, especially enteroadherent E. coli in the colon. Uh, the Strophorema whippley or Whipple's disease, which you can see within foamy macrophages, although you really usually need an immunostain or a PAS stain to see it. And then actinomyces uh, I've seen on occasion in the colon and even in the gallbladder. So these are the bacteria that you can observe uh, on H&E, you know, plus or minus an additional stain. 
sticking with the stomach for case three, this is a patient, sorry, um, I uh, jumped the gun there. This is actually a colon case, although this particular organism is more often seen in the stomach in uh, GI tract infections. Patient with blood in stool and a colonic lesion. So here, this is low power. This is as low as I can get, but we are in the colon and we have this large mass filling the submucosa and even slightly chewing down into the muscularis propria. And at low power, you can tell it's a necrotic center with maybe a little bit of granulomatous or fibroblastic inflammation on the periphery. And the interesting thing about this case is that there's something in the middle. It's dead but it's in there. So let's look around a couple more organisms and let's go on a higher power. Even though it's dead, we'll see if we can make anything out. One characteristic aspect of this, and again, we can tell it's sort of an organism. It's not just some necrotic detritus or debris. There's a structure or the you know ghost of a structure here. And there's also this Y-shaped a uh, lumen of their, I believe, their digestive system here. So these are easier to observe in the stomach when they are intact and not dead. But in this case, this submucosal necrotic nodule of the colon is related to Anisakis simplex infection, which is a roundworm that inhabits fish and can infect humans. Uh, it's usually related to uncooked sushi. Anytime I, you know, get some salmon nigiri, I always double check. I've seen some um, photographs on Twitter um, of sushi served to you at a place that you really shouldn't go to. Uh, also, other countries may really enjoy ceviche or other raw fish dishes, and that's how patients get anisakis. Usually involves the stomach, luminal or maybe mural involvement. Uh, some mucosal necrotic nodules, as I've shown, can harbor anisakis, but more often show nonspecific debris or no identifiable fragments. Uh, and I was recently fortunate to be part of a um, worldwide collaboration that got a series of these together. Um, we publicized it on Twitter using the hashtag no name Paula because a lot of um, pathologists in Spain had seen these but didn't have a name for it. And I think that one of the people who initiated this was Laura Pastrian. If you know her on Twitter, she's Doctora Eosina. Uh, and she's the one who sent me this case. So I need to thank her. And she was one of the contributors. She had some of the best cases with organisms. My cases did not have any. So again, most of the time you're not going to see the organisms, but at least some of these do appear to be related to Anisakis. So they are definitely infectious. Uh, the good news is no patient really had problems on follow-up, I guess, because the organisms are clearly dead in these particular scenarios. And the differential of roundworms, also uh, known as nematodes in the digestive tract, uh, and I always have to refer to something like this. I can't memorize what's a nematode, what's a trematode, et cetera, but this is a nice list. Uh, Ascaris, which is, you know, the big old worm that may get just plucked out of the GI tract, Enterobius is the pinworm that you usually see in the appendix, so I've also seen it in the luminal colon. Uh, Trichuris, which is whipworm. Strongyloides, which has been called threadworm. Then there's the hookworms, which I've never gotten to see a case of, Ancelostoma or Necator. And then Toxocara, which I've also never seen a case of. So if you are somewhere where it's endemic and you see a case every week and you want to send me a good one, I will uh, forever be grateful and mention your name anytime I show it at a session like this. But until then, I'll just have to picture match if I ever get a case myself. Moving on to case number four, patient with abdominal pain and respiratory difficulty. This is not a lung biopsy. This is a GI biopsy, but the patient did have respiratory distress. And this is a duodenal biopsy. This was an in-house case here. We have a very good GI. Um, actually, is this the right case? I think I may have grabbed the wrong. I got my cases mixed up. Let's see what the deal is. Pretend you didn't see that. This is what I'm looking for. 
always some technical difficulty. This was the case that was provided by one of my colleagues. I believe it was uh, Dr. Brian Robinson. We have a very good GI pathology group here at Emory. But you'll see this duodenum biopsy is a little beat up. It's not celiac level blunting, but there's a little blunting. There's not really much in the way of increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, you know, the sorts of things you typically look for when you first check out a duodenal biopsy. But hopefully, while I've been talking, everyone has noticed that there's something going on in the lamina propria. There's all these fibrin thrombi filling the small blood vessels of the lamina propria. And there's some more over here, over here. Now, sometimes when you see this, you'll actually get ulceration on top, but in this case, there's just a whole bunch of fibrin thrombi, and that is because this is a case of duodenal injury secondary to SARS-CoV-2, which I don't think I have to tell anyone here is the virus responsible for COVID-19, and it is generally a pulmonary slash vascular disease. Um, you know, it it's a respiratory disease, but it's really a vascular disease. But the, va the GI tract obviously has vasculature, and up to half of infected patients do experience gastrointestinal symptoms, the findings of which do vary. There are some review papers on the various uh, manifestations of COVID-19 in the GI tract, but uh, ischemic enterocolitis with fibrin thrombi is perhaps the most common. The liver may also be involved. Um, Dr. Stephen Lagana has published a lot on that. Um, and findings have included steatosis, acute hepatitis, biliary injury, and of course, vascular injury. So the differential for quote, invisible infections in the digestive tract, where you can see the injury they cause, but you're not really going to see the organism themselves, includes um, Clostridium or Clostridioides difficile, which is um, pseudomembranous or antibiotic associated colitis. Chlamydia and gonorrhea, which are anal infections. Uh, Chagas disease, you're usually not going to see the organism. Uh, that's Trypanosoma cruzi, which can cause toxic megacolon. Uh, Bartonella can cause cat stretch disease, more often in the liver. Uh, Malacoplakia is usually caused by defective repair or response to bacterial organisms, and you're not going to see the bacteria, but you're going to see the Malacoplakia mass lesion. Then various bacteria, salmonella, vibrio, et cetera, can cause acute self-limited infectious colitis. And then uh, herpes, uh, human herpes virus 8 can cause Kaposi sarcoma, which again, you're not going to see the organism, but you're going to see the sarcoma uh, in these patients. So that's your differential for invisible infections in the digestive tract. And now let's move on to the slide um, I had prepared for the last case. This is a patient with mild abdominal pain. And we are still in the duodenum. But when we go in, you'll notice it doesn't look too bad. Maybe very slightly reactive. It looks bad because I can't get in focus. Here we are now. So we look around, doesn't look too bad. Little reactive, maybe. Minimal blunting, et cetera. But then as we're crawling along, we see one little thing that catches our attention for this infectious insanity. And here we have, you know, what is this in this crypt lumen? Is this some calcification, some fecal debris? No, it's uh, our little friend, the threadworm we were mentioning earlier. You can kind of make out some of the structure. So this is not a rip roaring infection. This is a very somewhat subtle focal infection. This is the only focus in this particular biopsy, but this patient has infection by strongyloides. Uh, strongyloides stercoralis is a roundworm that penetrates the skin, then migrates to the small intestine. So uh, it, it's a bug on the move. Now patients with minor infections, such as this patient, are often fairly asymptomatic. If the worms are scant, they may be identified only by focal mucosal eosinophilia. I've seen cases where the tip-off was that there was a lot of eosinophils in the lamina propria, and you get a bunch of levels, and something like I just showed you maybe barely turns up. 
Now, immunocompromised patients may develop systemic hyperinfection, and those are the patients with a million organisms where you're going to see it, you know, almost at 1x when you um, look at the slide sitting in the, uh, in the cardboard tray, because those patients have a much higher parasite burden. So we've already discussed the differential for roundworms. I won't go back over that, but you can, of course, refer to that from an earlier case. This is a neat case that I found in the archives here at Emory. Um, neat in terms of the findings, that is. This is a patient with weight loss, diarrhea, and colonic ulcerations. So this is a colon resection. You can see that we have a section of large bowel. And you can already tell that there's some sort of abscess or necrotic debris. And if we move along, maybe you'll get the sense that these are actually sort of necrotic granulomas. There's something more obviously kind of a granuloma. There might be a vessel. There's some histiocytes. There's a nice multinuclear giant cell. You can pick it out even at this power. And it's somewhat confluent. And on higher power, we can tell it's definitely necrotic. So obviously, when you're seeing necrotizing granulomatous inflammation, you're going to think tuberculosis. Now, in many countries in the world, this is a relatively common diagnosis, or at least one that people have a decent amount of experience with. In the United States, that is not the case, and it's very rare to see tuberculosis, um, especially in the GI tract. But when you do suspect it, you get an AFB stain, and you spend a lot of time looking at it. Uh, last week, I spent about an hour staring carefully at three AFB stains on some granulomas that ended up not having any organisms that I could see. So I'm not going to do that to you this case. I'm going to go ahead and have dotted everything beforehand so we can expedite the findings. But I'm going to go here and let's get in on the highest power focus. And hopefully you can already tell that we've got some nice red snappers here. I'm going to annotate them because if I try to use my arrow, I'll never make it but we've got a few right here. We've got one right here. There's actually a decent amount. There's one right here. And I know there's more. Here we go. There's probably even more. Look at this. So this is actually a pretty good amount. This is an excellent focus of mycobacterium tuberculosis in the GI tract, which is why I dotted this area. And hopefully everyone has gotten a good look at them. This is the most satisfying case I've seen. I've seen one other case where there was maybe one organism. And as I just mentioned, I've had um, a handful of cases where the final result was much less satisfying because you end up with granulomatous inflammation and nothing more to say. So this is a patient with colonic tuberculosis, which is fairly rare in the United States, maybe less so in other countries. So AFB is an uh, so mycobacterium tuberculosis is an acid fast bacterium, AFB, that preferentially involves the respiratory tract. If you do have bowel infection, the ileocecal area is in fact the most common site, so it makes sense that that's where it's appearing in this patient. Uh, and I've already discussed, you have mural necrotizing granulomas, and you look carefully at an AFB stain. Now, the real only differential for AFB positive organisms in the digestive tract will be uh, mycobacterium avium complex, sometimes known as mycobacterium avium intracellulari, but that is gonna be much easier to spot because there's millions of organisms, or well, not millions, but there's organisms of plenty. You're gonna see the red staining at low power because there's so many of them. And histologically, that usually manifests as foamy macrophages, rather than necrotizing granulomas. So it's going to be a little bit different, but they are going to be acid fast if you have a case of that. I've seen it in the duodenum, the colon, even the liver. All right, I think that's one third of the way through the cases and we're halfway through our time. So I'll either pick up the pace or hopefully you're so riveted that you'll stick around when I go over time. Case seven, this is a patient with abdominal pain and this is a colon sample and you can tell because there's a tiny piece of colon here, but mostly what we're looking at is this worm here. I wanted to have at least one worm that got plucked out. We mostly get to appreciate the worm. That'll happen with some of the larger worms, uh, any being the largest, 
but also, you know, tapeworms, hookworms, etc. Now, if we go in, I think the first thing you're going to notice is it is a gravid female. There is a ton of eggs here, and you can kind of picture this kind of plug, this blunt-ended plug at the end of the eggs here. There's a really good one right there, if that's showing. Let me switch to green. That's probably projecting a little better. Should have done that from the beginning. But you can tell that we have a very gravid female. And another clue to this worm, in my experience, is this pigmented structure. I believe this is the digestive tract. It's certainly not the um, reproductive tract because there's eggs in that. But this particular worm that we're looking at here is the whipworm, Trichurus trichura, um, or something like that. I'm not a Latin scholar. Um, going to be easier to pick up the female because of all those eggs, but of course you can get male worms as well. Uh, these roundworms are transmitted via the fecal oral route and are more common in children. The worms tend to hang out in the proximal colon. Often going to be diagnosed uh, via stool analysis because there's a high egg concentration in the stool. I don't think that'll surprise anyone who just saw how many eggs the gravid female has. And sometimes if you just get a sample of the underlying mucosa, it's been reported to show increased histiocytes in some patients, though you may have noticed in this case that we didn't really see that. So we've already discussed the differential for roundworms. Again, I won't belabor that point, but you can go back if you want. Next up, we have a patient with a fever and a colon mass for this case. And uh, I know this is upside down. Sometimes the tissue ends up upside down on the slide and you just run with it. So the colon mass is mostly this adenocarcinoma here that I'll put into focus. And this is the correct slide. I wasn't uh, confused, but I wanted to, again, point out that sometimes an infection may not be the most obvious thing. It may be something that you incidentally pick up. So if we go down here, I think you can see these little structures here. And if we go over maybe to this area, go in on higher power, we'll see even more of them. These are not supposed to be there. These are not histiocytes. Find a couple more here. These little guys are actually amoeba. So this is another infectious case. The, uh, the colon adenocarcinoma, of course, is going to cause more problems for the patient than the infection. But this patient did have infection in the, in the colon by entamoeba histolytica, which is a uh, protozoan organism also transmitted by the fecal oral route, but it can be transmitted orally anally as well. This can cause systemic symptoms and disseminate. You can get it in the liver, also in the GI tract. This is another one where the infection is usually detected via stool analysis, but most cases I've seen in the colon arise from biopsies of colonic ulcers, and those are usually flask-shaped ulcers teeming with organisms. You see a bunch of them. They're easy to pick up. They'll show those ingested red blood cells. It's not going to be a subtle um, incidental finding here. This was a case sent to me by a colleague in Japan. It was several years ago, so I apologize if I don't remember correctly, but I believe it was Keisuke Goto. So I need to thank him. And if it wasn't him, thank you to whoever did send me the slide. Now, if you're not convinced that the organism is what you think it is, they are PAS positive. So that can confirm the diagnosis for you. And finally, they really are an incidental bystander in this case. Some organisms, specifically schistosomiasis, have been linked to colon cancer. So if you get a colon cancer and you see schistosomiasis next to it, which I have seen, that's not incidental. That is perhaps causative. This case was just happenstance sort of uh, for fun, you know, quote unquote, in this patient. And the differential diagnosis for protozoa in the GI tract, some of these are going to sort of be outside the mucosa, so to speak. Giardia or Ballantidium will be mostly floating in the lumen. Some of them, like Cryptosporidium, will be on the lumen. And then the really subtle ones that um, 
can be really tricky to pick up are usually kind of within the you, the epithelial mucosal cells. Uh, Microspiridia, enterocytosuin, also cyclospora and uh, cystoisospora can all be seen within the lumen, sorry, within the epithelium of the GI tract, often the duodenum. And those are pretty rare in these days now that a lot of um, immunocompromising states such as HIV can be fairly well controlled. Moving on, almost halfway done, this is a patient with an anal ulceration and a stricture, and they went in and cleared that out. And we do have anal tissue. I know that the anus is everyone's favorite organ in the GI tract, which is why I included this case. And you see mostly normal, you see some smudged paraffin there, but then you see this ulcerated area with a lot of inflammation underneath. And it's really a lot of plasma cells, a lot of plasma cells, some lymphocytes as well. What we're not really seeing on the H&E at least is organisms. And this is another one of those invisible infections. So you can do some stains to try to pick out whether there's a stainable organism present. And in this case, there was not. However, we did have the results from additional clinical testing, which is why I know this patient had lymphogranuloma venereum caused by chlam chlamydia trachomatis, which is, of course, a sexually transmitted infection. Bacterium spread via sexual contact. Cerevars L1, L2, L3 are the ones that cause LGV. And this is an anal disease usually seen in HIV-positive men who have sex with men. Not always, but that's going to be your highest at-risk population. Um, as the name obviously implies, uh, you can get local lymphadenopathy from these patients in addition to involvement of the rectum. Now, sometimes in chlamydial infection, you may be able to observe elementary bodies, but that's uh, usually through ancillary techniques. It's very rare to see them via light microscopy, and you definitely couldn't in this case. You had to have the ancillary clinical information. Now, there's no readily available immunostain that I'm aware of. I believe um, my colleagues down the street at the Centers for Disease Control do have some sort of immunostain available to them if they want to confirm a case. But I think uh, otherwise, you've just got to put on your detective hat and jump into the patient's clinical record. Differential of invisible infections already discussed. And we're going to stick around with the anus because, as I said, it is everyone's favorite GI tract organ, hypopigmented anal lesion. And this case was sent to me by Dr. Rhonda Yantis. She and I traded cases of uh, this particular infectious organism a while back. And this was the excellent case she kindly sent me. Now, at first, it looks a little bit like what we had before. A lot of lymphopoiesis inflammation in the anus. Now this was more of a visible lesion kind of raised. It's not obviously a condyloma, but you can kind of tell it's maybe a little bit more hyperplastic looking than the last case. This one also happens to have a lot of acute inflammation involving the squamous epithelium in addition to all this lymphopathic inflammation. So this is not another case of, nice, of chlamydia. This is also not a case of uh, Neisseria, which I believe there was a nice series published on recently. What we have is something that is not entirely invisible because of this immunostain. At low power, I think you can pick up this whopping infection, but let's go to higher power and confirm that we're dealing with all these little squigglies here. You can get in even higher power maybe if I get focused. This is not subtle. This is a rip-roaring amount of syphilis in the rectum of this patient. That, of course, being what the stain is. So this is condyloma lata, which is the term for a condylomatous lesion of anal syphilis. Of course, caused by treponema pallidum, which is what this stain targeted. And it's a spirochete spread via sexual contact. Now, syphilis is experiencing a resurgence in the United States. Um, 
a lot, there's a lot that's been published recently on anal rectal syphilis. You'll see rectal biopsies where there's a lot of lymphoplasmic inflammation, usually more kind of in the lamina propria or submucosa rather than involving the epithelium. And of course, you can do the stain to confirm it. Some places may just have the silver stain, which you can use. The immunostain is going to be more reliable, but it's important to realize that it may be negative post-treatment. So if they think, we think this patient has syphilis, they zap them with doxycycline or, or whichever, and then they do the biopsy. You may still see the inflammation, but of course you're not going to see the organism and you're just going to have to say, you know, it may have been syphilis, but we can't prove it any longer. And the differential of spirochetes in the GI tract is fairly limited. The other option is really going to be spiroketosis, which is caused by brachyspira, which is what causes intestinal spirochetosis. And it's that little fuzzy kind of rim of, uh, of hair-like appearance along the epithelial surface of the intestinal tract. And that usually is incidental. It causes no to mild symptoms and no to mild changes in the actual tissue underneath the epithelial surface. All right, so since a lot of infections can involve the liver, that's going to be it for the luminal GI tract, and the rest of my cases are going to involve the liver, starting with this patient who arrives, presents in shock. And that's not going to be any surprise given how dead their liver is. You can tell that low power, there's a lot of necrosis in this liver, and this is termed geographic necrosis because it almost has a kind of a pseudo map like distribution. It's not zone one or zone three, et cetera. Zone one being what you see in things like yellow fever, which is another diagnosis I've never seen in the liver, but I get those, I bet those folks over at the CDC have. Now, higher power, whole lot of dead hemorrhagic liver, but our clue is going to be in the surviving liver. Let me find a good area and wander over to it. So these hepatocyte nuclei aren't totally normal. Some of them are. These few up here are normal hepatocyte nuclei, but the rest of these are kind of almost smudgy. They're kind of pink purple. They're glassy with a little bit of margination. You can just pick out some accentuation of the chromatin at the rim. Now, I know we don't have multinucleation, so we don't have all three of the M's, but two out of three ain't bad, as they say. And in my experience, when you see this in the liver, you tend not to have a lot of multinucleation. You're just going to have margination. Um, and I guess it's hard to say you have molding when there's not multinuclei. So I guess we only have one out of three, but this would be positive on immunostain, and that ain't bad. That will confirm our diagnosis of herpes hepatitis in this patient. So HSV, again, pretty common throughout the digestive tract in general. Hopefully we've all seen some cases. Um, herpes viridae is spread via the oral or the genital route. HSV itself is fairly rare in the liver. Patients are usually pregnant or, as in this patient, immunocompromised, though it can occur in the neonates. It's the H in torch for the torch infections. But unfortunately, when the liver is involved like this, it is often fatal, even if they get rapid antiviral therapy and even a liver transplant. But you saw how dead that liver was. Unfortunately, there's little hope for these patients. Now, the main histologic diagnosis in these cases is going to be adenovirus, which is going to look very similar with the glassy nuclei. It doesn't cause margination, um, sorry, it doesn't cause multinucleation or really molding if you see it, say, in the luminal GI tract, but I already mentioned in the liver, that's less likely to be observed. So you've really got to use the adenovirus immunostain to confirm that's what's happening. Um, it can also cause geographic necrosis. And we've already discussed the differential for viral cytopathic effect. So now we'll move on to case number 12. This is a patient with jaundice. And what do you do with the jaundice patient? You take a liver biopsy. And at low power, this doesn't really look too bad. There's maybe a little bit of chronic inflammation, very minimal uh, changes otherwise. 
but let's go on a higher power because I am indeed showing this for a reason, and maybe this is going to be our best area. Hopefully you can already tell what I'm looking at, but if not, let's go on a higher power. And we were talking about glassy nuclei in that last case with herpes, but now let's talk about glassy cytoplasm. These are ground glass hepatocytes. I think you can pick them up from the intervening parenchyma. And we even also have some glassy nuclei, which is something you can see in this as well. This, of course, be, uh, being herpes B, <laughs> herpes, I'm really, there's a lot of viruses with H, hepatitis B infection, HPV. This is not me trying to trick you with the mimicker. This is a solid classic case of ground glass hepatocytes due to hepatitis B infection. So this is a hepadna or HEPA DNA, if you want to remember that it's a DNA virus, HEPA DNA virus with worldwide distribution. A vaccine is available, but of course, not everyone may necessarily have access to it, unfortunately. It is often subclinical. It presents acutely, but then can truck along subclinically for a while, but will eventually lead to cirrhosis. And one thing that serves as both sort of a fun trivia fact and an important point is that patients with hepatitis B can develop hepatocellular carcinoma before developing cirrhosis. So if you ever get um, HCC and a non cirrhotic liver, keep that in mind. Now the ground glass inclusions represent surface antigen in the endoplasmic reticulum. And as I mentioned, you can also see sometimes glassy inclusions in nuclei as well. These are not seen in, in acute infection. This is only in chronic infection. And there is an immunostain that exists if you really wish to prove it, but usually these patients are gonna have a serologic diagnosis of hepatitis B, you'll know it clinically, and then the histology will confirm it for you. But there is a differential of those ground glass or pseudo ground glass inclusions. Fibrinogen can, include it, can cause it, uh, which can be either incidental or patients with sort of, you know, the fibrinogen uh, storage type diseases. There's also the glycogen storage diseases of which there's probably 80 at this point, and I admittedly can never keep them track, keep, keep uh, track of them all, but I know where to look them up and I know to suspect them. And some of them will look a lot like this case I just showed you. Lafora disease can cause it. And then a lot of different drugs, uh, the prototype perhaps being cyanamide, a lot of drug-induced liver injury can cause similar ground glass inclusions. Moving on, patient with abdominal pain and travel history. Travel history, of course, being a very general statement, but I don't wanna give it away just yet. Now this liver looks a bit more inflamed, kinda again, generic, nonspecific, maybe some chronic portal inflammation, perhaps a little bit of sinusoidal dilation, maybe that means something, maybe not. But this is a case where we're going to have to go in on a little higher power and walk around. And maybe you've noticed something. Go in a little bit higher. And you can see this speckled brown black pigment deposited in the portal tract. And it's not just there. Let's look around. There's more here can see it in this as well. So we have some kind of mild nonspecific chronic inflammation, but we also have this variably coarse to chunky uh, pigment in a patient who had recently traveled to Africa. And with that information, and of course some confirmatory clinical testing, we can determine that this patient has hepatic injury due to malaria, which of course is caused by the genus Plasmodium, of which there are multiple species. You get infected with it uh, via a mosquito bite, and the organism replicates in red blood cells and in hepatocytes. So you absolutely have to consider um, liver involvement by patients in patients who have malaria. Now, this is just a biopsy. This was not an autopsy or a transplant or anything drastic. But um, if you do get a look at the liver grossly, it can be enlarged and brownish black, and that's because of this hemozoan pigment that we were just looking at. That's what's deposited in the liver, and that's what confirms this diagnosis. 
Now, otherwise the changes are nonspecific and can vary, and you don't always get that pigment, unfortunately. In this case, we were fortunate and had it, but if you didn't have it and you just had nonspecific symptoms, but you were able to determine the patient uh, had traveled to an endemic area or was known to have malarial infection, then you could say that that is certainly a possibility. And the other thing to consider when you see hemozoan pigment in the liver is schistosomiasis. Schisto is very interesting in the liver. Um, it's a very common cause of non serotic portal hypertension, particularly outside the United States. And it's not like in the GI tract where you often see a lot of organisms. Maybe you'll see a bilharzial polyp with dozens of eggs and calcified organisms. You might see one or two eggs on multiple serial sections. So compared to the luminal GI tract, you really have to hunt if you're suspecting schistosomiasis in the liver. All right, case number 14, patient, young patient, lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly. So here's our biopsy. Here, I think we're conventionally getting into some chronic portal inflammation. You can see here how dark the portal tracts are at lower power. But let's go in on higher power, get a better look. Definitely some chronic inflammation, no question. Then if we walk around, that's not the only place we see the lymphocytes. There's also a decent cohort of them filling the sinusoids. And I know that's a bit bright because I went out on lower power, but here is an even better area to convince you that the lymphocytes are filling the sinusoids in addition to involving the portal tract. So that does give us a differential diagnosis, which I'll discuss more in a minute, but here is our confirmatory stain, not uh, this edge artifact, but if we walk around a bit, we will see that a couple of the lymphocytes do light up on this in situ hybridization stain which I have to mention, but it'll give away the diagnosis, that this is an Eber-ish. One important point is that these are more in the lobule. They're not actually in the sinusoid. So it's a different population of lymphocytes that are positive for the stain, but it still confirms our diagnosis of EBV hepatitis. Epstein-Barr virus is a human herpes virus number four. Most humans uh, do have an infection, but it's usually, you know, latent subclinical, but it can reactivate in patients for whatever given reason. Liver involvement can occur in immunocompromised or immunocompetent patients. You know, uh, a teenager may get uh, infectious mononucleosis, for example, and not be immunocompromised. The disease is usually self-limited, but can be chronic and can even cause hepatic failure. So it's not something to take lightly. And the histologic findings include a sinusoidal infiltrate of responding T cells. And then the remaining lymphocytes are the infected B cells, which is what we saw on the stain in this case. Now the differential for sinusoidal lymphocytosis includes various drugs, autoimmune hepatitis, not commonly, but I've seen it, Hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma, definitely don't want to miss that. And then hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, although that's usually more histiocytes, filling the sinusoids and engorging the red blood cells. Four cases to go. This is a liver resection on a patient with abdominal pain and a biliary stricture. And this is an amazing case that came across the desk of my colleague at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Monica Vias, who of course, quickly showed it to everyone in the department. So you can see um, there's a lot of bile floating around. There's fibrosis, cirrhosis, duct ectasia, dilated bile ducts. And then when we get over to the largest dilated bile duct, we see a lot of just chunky bile junk. But that's not all. There's a little more than just bile in here. Much like we had that Anisakis organism where you could kind of tell there used to be an organism here, you can kind of make out various structures. 
And uh, I'm no uh, Dr. Bobby Pritt. I'm no parasite gal. So I must admit, I cannot name you every last structure that we are seeing here. But there's enough evidence based on the fact that this is involving the biliary system, uh, involved it, died in it, and soaked in bile for a very, very long time to confirm, uh, and it actually has some eggs as well, so this was another gravid female, um, but we could confirm in this liver explant from someone who emigrated from Asia that this is a liver fluke, Clinorchus sinensis, sitting dead in a bile duct. So these guys are, are, are gals, this is a female fluke, transmitted via eating undercooked fish. And again, certain countries see a lot of this. We see very few of this, very little of this in the United States. This is the only case I've seen. And again, it was from a patient who migrated from a high-risk area. Uh, after ingestion, it crawls into the ampulla and wriggles its way up the biliary tract. So it's uh, definitely another worm on the move. Mostly seen in Asia, especially uh, China. I've also seen a case that someone in Thailand very kindly sent me. Rare in the US. The diagnosis is usually made via eggs in the stool rather than finding the worm. Um, but this is another thing that's not just incidental. It can cause cholangiocarcinoma and it can also cause recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. So I actually seen patients who got liver transplants for RPC who didn't have any visible worms but may have had an infection in the past. Now the differential for flatworm flukes or trematodes um, really is opus thorcus in addition to clinensis, fasciola hepatica, and then the one we see most often, but we may not think of in the same breath because it has a bit of a different look, is schistosoma. We usually see the eggs of schistosoma, but you can rarely see worms as well. All right, I know we're coming up on the hour, but I've got three more cases and I want to take questions. Um, if you're watching this live, I hope you can stick around. And if you're watching this after the fact, I hope you get allotted yourself slightly more than an hour to watch. This is a patient, number 16, fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice, still in the liver. So at low power, the most um, obvious thing you're going to see is macrovesicular steatosis, which in this particular case is incidental. A lot of patients have macrovesicular steatosis, especially given the, uh, the average BMI in the United States. But at low power, maybe you're picking up that there's a little more in here. We've got some granulomas, in fact. So we'll go in a little higher power, get in focus. Look at them here. So some of these, let me see if I can find a good example. Of course, I went to the thing I really wanted to show first. But what I wanted to demonstrate, and of course, I'm suddenly not able to, some of these granulomas are kind of just granuloma NOS. There's a decent one. Just looks a, bit, a little bit like any old granuloma you might encounter in the liver or GI tract. But some of them have a different appearance. And of course, now that I've moved off of it, I'll never find it again. Here we go. I actually succeeded. This granuloma move the slide just slightly. There. Has this vacuole right in the middle, which is probably a fat droplet has the granulomatous inflammation, and then has these thin wisps of fibrin, almost forming a little kind of donut, and now I'm hungry, a little donut around in the center. So I'm not going to spend, there's a couple more of these that are in the slide somewhere, but I won't belabor the point just to say that these are fibrin ring granulomas in a patient who has Q fever, which is caused by Coxiella burnettii, which is a gram-negative coccobacillus found in farm animals. So you may encounter it more often in patients who live in rural uh, areas or work on farms. It occurs via inhalation, and it can be an acute or a chronic infection. And again, liver, liver biopsy is not going to be your gold standard. It's going to be serology. And it is the prototypical but not the only cause of fibrin ring granulomas in the liver. And I will say 
that I helped co-author a pathology outlines topic on Q fever, which should be up on the site shortly, but I don't think is up today. Now, the differential of granulomas in general, obviously extremely broad. In the liver, we're looking at primary biliary cholangitis, primarily, can involve the portal tracts or the lobules. CMV can cause granulomas. EBV can do it. Tuberculosis, of course, can do it. Obviously, sarcoidosis. I've seen Crohn's granulomas in the liver, but it's rare. Drug-induced liver injury, various drugs can do it. And then it's been reported to happen in some patients with malignancy. Case 17, patient with a large liver cyst, and we're not even going to have any liver tissue. We're just going to have all the junk that came out from the liver cyst. We're going to see this lamellated material here that's sort of a rim. We're going to see this junk, this almost sand-like material. See it easier if I turn the light down a little bit. But I'm going to turn the light right back up on high power because we are seeing some calcified structures in this junk. But then if we walk around a bit, that's not the only thing we pick up. Let's see if I can show you. I think you can see right up top. If I walk up and down, you can make out these little hooklets, these nasty little stabby teeth that are floating in this sand. So this, of course, is a hydatid cyst caused in this patient by Echinococcus granulosis, which is a flatworm transmitted delightfully via dog feces. The liver is the most common site for cysts. And of course, that's where I see them since I do GI and liver pathology, but it can occur in the lungs, the brain, and other organs. The cysts do enlarge slowly and are commonly asymptomatic, um, but they, if you receive them, they contain fluid and sediment material, which is the hydatid sand, and then microscopically you can see the organisms. And if you're about to take your boards, remember that these have to be resected very carefully because if the cyst ruptures and the material gets in the patient, it can cause anaphylaxis. And the differential for uh, cestodes or flatworm tapeworms in the digestive tract, fairly limited to diphilobothrium, which is another thing that I have yet to see. And now the final case, maybe I saved the best for last, maybe not, you get to be the judge. Patient with a liver mass and they biopsied it. They didn't give us too much. There was a little more on the initial sample, but this got a lot of stains. And then this is my teaching recut on top of it. So you're going to see a little bit of background liver parenchyma to prove to you that we're in the liver. You're gonna see some necrotic material, the sort of a necrotic center. And then focally, you're gonna see this spindled cell proliferation, fairly bland, not too ugly, but it's definitely a spindle cell process here. And several stains were done on this, you know, rule out the common things, neoplasms, et cetera, et cetera. And most stains were negative, but one stain was not. And this is the stain that was positive. And if this stain looks a little familiar, it's because I kind of cheated a little bit. Now, where did the slide go? It decided to jump on me. Here we go. I've already shown you this organism and this immunostain today. This is another case of syphilis. This is a patient who had a syphilitic pseudotumor in the liver. So we've already talked about syphilis. I won't repeat that. But secondary syphilis can involve the liver and have multiple appearances. I was recently part of a group that published a, a series of this in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology, if you want to read more. Uh, now, I believe the most common pattern was biliary pattern injury. Some patients also had acute hepatitis or nonspecific changes. One patient had autoimmune hepatitis-like changes. But a few patients, including this uh, one, had a fiber inflammatory mass lesion. And the last thing to point out is that this is secondary, not tertiary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis causes gummas, which are still necrotic, but they are necrotic granulomas, not kind of a 
fibroblastic spindle cell tumor. And the main differential for infectious inflammatory pseudotumors in the digestive tract and in soft tissue in general, because it can occur elsewhere, is mycobacteria. Uh, I guess you could also think about um, EBV positive spindle cell tumor, um, but it's really a smooth muscle spindle cell tumor. So it'll look like a leiomyoma, but it'll turn out to be EBV positive. So that's a little different than what we're thinking about today. All right. Thank you for going on this fun tour that took 65 minutes. I'm going to put uh, share my screen back up and take um, Q&A. If you have any questions, please direct, direct them to Rafat via Facebook or via uh, YouTube. And of course, we've also got that hashtag. And of course, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. This was a great talk on so many um, common as well as, uh, you know, less common infectious agents across the digestive tract. So thanks a lot. Uh, there are a few questions online, so let me find them for you. Okay. And um, so here is one. So I'm going to read, uh, uh, take all the questions there, there, and hopefully, you know, I mean, uh, we will have enough time. So this is about morphology of different viral cytopathic effects. And the question is, uh, can you please go over the nuclear changes in adenovirus versus CMV versus herpes, as I often find it difficult to differentiate? Certainly. And I agree with you that it can be challenging. So CMV is usually... Um, pinkish purple and sometimes even kind of a bright reddish pink depending on the stain it can cause nuclear effect and also it can cause inclusions in the cytoplasm as well which look a little different but often smaller it's also important to look at what cells get infected cmv likes to affect endothelium whereas um, most of these other viruses will not the other viruses herpes varicella and adenovirus are usually much more glassy rather than kind of uh, almost chunky, but definitely not kind of a glassy translucent appearance. Herpes has your classic margination, multinucleation, and molding, and it's going to be kind of a purplish appearance. Varicella zoster will look almost exactly the same, but you have to really do the stain to confirm the difference. There was a paper a couple of years ago in AGSP on varicella zoster infection in the upper GI tract. And I didn't contribute any cases myself, but I saw one of the cases that was contributed. And the background histology of the infected esophagus was a bit different, but the viral cytopathic effect was fairly similar. And then adenovirus, still glassy. For me, it's the most subtle because the there's not really nuclear enlargement. You don't get the mega of cytomegalovirus, and you also don't get the multinucleation. So adenovirus, I think, can be subtle, but anytime you get um, an ulceration in the GI tract, doesn't hurt to take a quick look. And of course, if you see geographic necrosis in the liver, you should look as well, and you would need to confirm via immunostain. The last thing I will mention is measles, which causes viral cytopathic effect via the Warth and Finkelty giant cells. Fairly rare, but it is, uh, you know, rising in incidence currently, unfortunately. And those are just going to cause giant cells. You should be able to see those at low or at worst intermediate power. It's very characteristic, unlikely to confuse those for the other types. So, and of course, when in doubt, you can do an immunostain. There are some scenarios, maybe a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, where there's really revved up inflammatory cells in an ulcer bed that may or may not be CMV, and in that case, you need to do the immunostain just to be sure. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one is uh, more of a comment from one of our viewers. So let me read that for you. So uh, this is about echinococcus. Yes. And uh, our viewer says that, uh, uh, let me just uh, take it to the center. Okay. So that for echinococcus, both dogs and wolves are definitive hosts and uh, cervids, whether I pronounce it right, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. deer and moose are common intermediate hosts. 
With the explosion of deer population, that means a major route of transmission uh, in the US is camping, hunting, outdoor adventuring, drinking water contaminated by wolf, coyote, or dog droppings, uh, only killed by boiling. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank you for mentioning that. Obviously, with 18 cases in an hour, I did not have the time to go into the life cycle of every organism, but that's very important. I think there was a nice series in AGSP a couple of years ago of several cases in the liver and lung, highlighting how this is becoming more common. And it's nice to remember what the infectious organisms are. You mentioned dogs and wolves. I was about to say, uh, if you get a wolf via, if you encounter a wolf, I think primary transmission of a kinococcus might be the least of your worries. But you raise, of course, a great point that it could uh, befoul the water that campers might end up drinking. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me read this next question. Uh, from one of our viewers on YouTube. So this is uh, a viewer who is saying hello to you from Saudi Arabia. Hello. And so the question is that uh, uh, there was a case of gastric biopsy with ovoid shaped intraepithelial eosinophils to red bodies. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there is no picture, but it's a morphologic description. And uh, so, what are your differential diagnoses on suscitating? Sure. So if they were <laughs> intraepithelial, you would think about uh, microsporidia, which are super, super tiny. It's almost like tiny dots. You can barely see them, but they'll inhabit a little vacuole, so you might be able to observe them. There's also um, what, cyclospora, which is more about the size of a lymphocyte, but again, we'll be in a bit of a vacuole. So it might be hard to distinguish from a lymphocyte, but those can be involved. And then cystoisospora is the sort of more banana shaped. It might depend on the tangential, uh, on the cut. If it's a tangential cut, it might not get the full banana shape, but those are a little bit more obviously inclusions because they, they're not perfectly rounded. Those are gonna be the, your main things for within the epithelial cells. Uh, and if you do, I, I do show two I, two of those three diagnoses in that use cap lecture I mentioned, if you want to look at them that way. Of course, there's also plenty of photographs online and in books if you want to look at them that way. But that would be my differential for intracellular organisms involving epithelium in the GI tract. One of our viewers has an interesting comment on that question that, oh, maybe those are actually Russell bodies inside the cytoplasm. Yeah, so Russell bodies, yeah, if it's in plasma cells, it would be Russell bodies. They're usually fairly round and they're very, very bright pink. And that, of course, is just aggregates of immunoglobulin and plasma cells. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention is that for a while people were seeing what they suspected were cystoisospora in gallbladders, but it ended up being aggregations of cytoplasmic filaments. Um, there's also another potential differential is aggregates of dying material, I think that have been called thanatosomes in the liver, thanatos being either Greek or Latin for death. And of course, if you watched any of the 50 Marvel movies, there's Thanos, which is where he got that name from. But those would be other differentials that would not be infectious organisms, but could maybe make you think about the possibility of infection. Right. Uh, thank you so much. So there is another question. Uh, so it's about special stain. Do you think any special stains are useful in diagnosing infectious agents? I mean, I am sure uh, one means uh, not immunostains. So that trichromes may be useful in amoeba, our viewer says. So do you have any other tricks or any experience on using special stain for diagnosing uh, or picking up uh, sure. organisms? So obviously AFB for mycobacteria, GMS for fungal organisms, uh, including you know candida, histo when you see it, things like that. Otherwise, I must admit, I tend to stick to immunostains these days. Uh, trichromes and modified trichromes, modified acid fasts can help with some of the organisms I mentioned, the microsporidia, et cetera. Those are so vanishingly rare now that I just don't 
have use for them in daily practice. Um, beam sustains can be helpful for Helicobacter. I find them easier to see there than on H&E, though I do find the immunostain even easier. But again, if, if immunostains are not available to you, I would say obviously AFB GMS, maybe GIMSA for Helicobacter. And then if you are in an area that sees a high rate of certain other organisms where you need a modified trichrome or a modified AFB, something like that, then it would absolutely be useful in those scenarios. Thank you. All right. So uh, I think here is another more of a comment, this one. So this is about uh, so intestinal aspergillus niger. Oh, boy. After or due to COVID-19 and the possibility for intestinal biopsies. So maybe like you know, uh, one wants to know about your experience or thoughts on this. Uh, I feel very bad for any patients who come in that in that bad of shape. I personally have not seen any, and I don't know much about the literature on it. I'm not saying there isn't any. I'm saying it's not something I'm terribly familiar with, but I would suspect that the patient was probably just in bad shape already. Maybe they were immunocompromised, which of course may, puts the patient at um, increased risk for more severe code infections. My general rule of thumb is if there's fungus in the GI tract proper, not candida esophagitis, but if there's, you know, I've seen, you know, aspergillus or candida in the colon, uh, I've seen those mucor patients, I've seen histo in the duodenum, those patients are usually unfortunately very unstable uh, and have a high risk of disseminated disease. Um, but I can't say specifically aspergillus niger in COVID-19 patients. If you know more, Please feel free to put it in the chat and Rafat can read it and we can all learn from that. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. That would be great. Uh, so the next question is about uh, E. coli. So it seems that one of our viewers says that maybe you mentioned about E. coli. So can you actually identify E. coli on biopsies? So I've seen it a couple of times. I'm always a little wary to get a colon biopsy and see a little bit of bacteria and blame anything on it, because of course, a lot of these colon biopsies may have fecal contaminant, things like that. Obviously, upper GI tract ulcers can have a lot of bacteria. So I'm usually pretty cagey about it, but if you see a lot of bacteria adherent to the brush border area of the intestine, then you could think about enteroadherent E. coli. I would not top line it. I'm not confident enough in it, and it's not a common enough diagnosis. And again, there's going to be serology. There would be ancillary testing that could hopefully support any suspicion along those lines. But uh, that is kind of as far as I would go. If I saw convincing adherent bacteria, and you could get a gram stain if you wanted to confirm it, uh, that's another stain I could have mentioned in response to the last question. You know, if you've got a brown brand tissue gram stain or something, that could help to some degree in identifying bacteria. But obviously, sometimes you get uh, just floating bacteria that don't mean anything. And again, there are bacteria that we do know mean something. H. pylori is a bacterium, for instance. Uh, but that's the long answer. The short version is I, I wouldn't be too confident in blaming a couple of floating bacteria as a uh, you know, enter a hemorrhagic E. coli or something like that in a colon biopsy. Right. Uh, a colleague from South Africa is uh, uh, posting a comment that in their country, they see a lot of uh, tuberculosis. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would like to add from my own experience in when I was in India is that uh, in, uh, in, in a country where tuberculosis is more, is more prevalent, uh, when you see a granuloma in a colon biopsy, for example, so, and even if there is no necrosis, so the differential diagnosis is first tuberculosis, but not Crohn's disease, unlike what we think here. So yeah, just to add that. And in that case, so differentiation between tuberculosis and Crohn's becomes very tricky because most of the time, even for TB, uh, we hardly see organisms in endemic areas. Absolutely. And, you know, I did mention that it really, you, you have to know your patient population. You have to know where you're practicing. If I see granulomas in a colon biopsy, my first thought is going to be Crohn's because that's the patient population whose material I review. 
But if I get a colon biopsy and Crohn's is not in the differential, I'll go ahead and get an AFB and a GMS. Um, almost always negative. I don't actually expect to find anything, but the possibility exists that I can at least rule out some possibilities or if I'm really lucky, catch something. So I would still go ahead and get those stains, but I'm not holding my breath when I review them. All right. Uh, so here is another very interesting question, I think uh, very pertinent, that you showed uh, syphilis immunostain nicely uh, from a representative case. So do you stain for syphilis for all anal biopsies with increased lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate? And what is your yield like when you do sure. it regularly? So I personally you? don't. I will get them if there's a good amount of inflammation in the anus or the rectum. If it's only proctitis, if it's pain colitis, I wouldn't really suspect it. Although what, what's to say, you know, there could be a young uh, male MSM patient with ulcerative colitis and, uh, you know, syphilis, proctitis, et cetera. The cases I showed were all either donated to me very generously or things that I found in the archives. I have occasionally stained cases. And my yield so far has been 0%. I've yet to actually succeed on a case. But it's one of those where it's something you don't want to miss. And if the clinician isn't suspecting it, you can really change someone's day by saying this is very treatable. You know, you may not be able to address the underlying risk factors that led to them getting this infection, but you can at least cure them of this infection and these symptoms. So I'll continue doing the stains. And I, I can't wait until my uh, success rate is something other than 0%. But right now, uh, you don't want me at bat. Thank you again. Uh, so this is a case on helicobacter. So you showed a case of helicobacter helmeny. What's your experience? Uh, and is it a little bit like, I mean, can you easily pick it on h &E or uh, you find it better on immune or GIMSA? And the second question on the same topic is, is there any treatment difference uh, between sure. H. pylori and H. helminthi? Sure. So in reverse order, there's no treatment difference I'm aware of. The same uh, antibiotic regimen, triple therapy works. For the first question, they they're easier and harder to see. I know that doesn't make that doesn't help, but they're larger, but they're they're usually fewer. If you remember the case I showed, there was one tiny aggregate of the helminthi that I had to. I knew where it was in the slide, which was why I was able to not spend five minutes fussing with the slide during this live stream. Um, so the immunostain can certainly help. And I would say many of the cases I've seen were because I suspected Helicobacter pylori and got the stain and then, excuse me, saw a couple big organisms in addition to the small ones. I freely admit I may have missed a couple cases where I saw some didn't miss, I didn't see them, but there's often a co-infection. So if there's a case I signed out as H. pylori and there is also H. helmonii, then the patient's going to get treated the same as I mentioned. So there's not going to be any adverse effect, fortunately. Now, if I knew it was from a pediatric patient, I'd spend a little more time on it. I, I saw it a bit more often during my first job as an attending in Rochester because we had pediatric cases mixed in but that's the last time I signed up pediatric cases. So now I'm seeing it much less frequently. So again, you know, knowing your patient population is going to perhaps influence how you approach the, the biopsies. Right. I think with that, Dr. Gonzalez, we have come to the end of the Q&A session. I do not see uh, more questions online. And to our viewers, if you have any other question or if you are watching the lecture, later. So please feel free to uh, post your question on Twitter with that hashtag infectious insanity as Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, and he will be more than happy to answer. And you can also email us. We will be very, very happy to forward your question to Dr. Gonzalez and he can answer. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Gonzalez, you have got a lot of uh, complimentary comments from so many viewers. And we had a uh, couple of hundred viewers who joined from countries as far as Ukraine, India, Sweden, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Germany. 
And thanks to our viewers for joining today, despite your time zone differences and for supporting our uh, endeavor on podcast. And if you like our lectures, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel that is podcast. And also you can follow our Facebook page uh, so that you can stay updated with all the upcoming lectures. And we have a website where you can get all the lectures. And as Dr. Gonzalez said, so this is the third one in his series of lectures that uh, the one on uh, neuroendocrine nuttiness and mesenchymal madness you can find on YouTube channel on podcast as well as on the website and uh, our next lecture is coming up that would be on February 14th and we would switch to pediatric pathology but somewhat related to GI still and uh, it would be on biliary atresia and its mimics so that would be a very good topic. And our speaker will be Dr. Kalyani Patel, who is from uh, Children's Hospital in Texas. So hope to see you at that time. And thanks again, Dr. Gonzalez, for this wonderful talk. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.